Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. It's Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode, Jack and I try something a little different and we take a piece of academic research and discuss what the research set out to accomplish and some practical takeaways. In this discussion, we look at the paper Replicating Anomalies, which tested over 450 value, momentum, investment, and other factors to try to identify what ones actually worked when adjusting for investability and screening out of small caps. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the discussion. All right, today we're gonna try something a little bit different. Um, What we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, identify and focus on a academic paper that um, is researching and looking at a specific topic or concept. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of talk about what that paper is trying to uncover, some of the research in that paper, and then we'll try to relate it to, I think, hopefully what are some practical sort of thoughts um, and ways that, you know, investors in the real world might be able to think about sort of the outcome of the research that we're going to highlight. So today we wanted to talk about the research paper Replicating Anomalies. It was written by Lu Zhang, um, who's a researcher and professor at Ohio State, um, along with a few of his other colleagues. And The paper is a really interesting one. Um, We're going to get into the details behind the paper, um, how it sort of looked at the effectiveness of the various factors, the hundreds of factors that have been studied um, in the academic community. But before we do that, I think, Jack, we wanted to kind of just sort of um, describe and define, I think, some of maybe some of the terms we're going to be using and some of the things that the research paper sort of um, highlighted sort of more at a higher level before we get into to the paper. So do you want to maybe start with defining some of those concepts to begin with? Yeah, there were a couple of points we want to make. One is specific to this paper and one is specific just to academic papers in general. And, and the first is it's important to understand because we're going to talk about the impact of micro caps on the performance of factors. It's important to, to lay the landscape for what the market looks like. And so if, if I were to go into our database right now of all the stocks we have data on, we probably have data on about 6,000 stocks. Of those 6,000 stocks, about 3,000 or so would not meet our minimum market cap and liquidity requirements. And and the paper has different requirements than us, but this is just a general example. So about half the stocks we get data for would not, we would not consider investable. Um, And so that's, that's an important backdrop when we think about academic testing, because if we flip it and look at the other way, look at the market in terms of market cap weighting, well, then those same half, those same 3000 stocks are something like 3% of the market cap of the entire market. So they're half of the sample and they're only 3% of the market cap. And so that's just an important thing to keep in mind as we go through the conclusions of this paper, because when you're testing factors, you know, how you test them and how you look at those universes plays a big role in the outcome you get. Um, and And the second thing, just to keep in mind with all academic research, and that's not really specific to this paper, but almost all academic research is long short. So if I'm testing a very simple, let's say the price to book strategy, what I would do is I would go long the bottom decile of the cheapest price to book stocks. And I would go short the top decile, the most expensive price to book stocks. And so a lot of times when people take academic research and translate it into running long only portfolios, which is the way most of us invest, they don't understand that difference. Because if, if most of the return of an academic paper comes on the short side, then maybe developing a long only factor may not be a good idea. So it's just important when we talk about results, as we talk about this paper, we're talking about long, short results, long, the best stocks, short, the worst stocks. Yeah, and just two things with that. I think the other thing with academic research is, you know, a lot of times it doesn't include trading costs or the indirect cost of trading. So, you know, when you look at these result, results sometimes, you know, if you have something that's generating, you know, maybe one or 2% excess return, but it doesn't include trading costs or slippage or things like that, you know, a lot of times those returns, the reason they don't sort of work in the real world is because those academic uh, tests may not have included that. And the other thing with sort of small caps is, you know, and this is kind of getting off the paper just for a second, is like when we run and build strategies, we're sort of cutting our, like you said, our investable universe. So our portfolios are really only trying to hold stocks that we know 
you know, are actually investable, not like micro cap, ultra small cap securities. There are, I would say, other um, quantitative investment firms that we know about that also run similar type of uh, strategies based on legendary investors and other um, proven methods. But they let the, those portfolios hold stocks that may have a $10 million market cap or $15 million market cap. So, you know, any significant size amount of assets trying to go into those portfolios, you know, you'd end up moving the stock. So to your point about this, this you know, the micro caps, and, and that's one of the things this paper looked at is, is you know, I think you just got to be when, when you see these strategies or tests or performance numbers, you know, you always want to kind of look under the hood and say, OK, what? What does the portfolio look like and what size companies are in here? Because it may not actually be realistic or even investable. That's right. I mean, that, that's an important way. And that sort of gets us into the, the idea of this paper, which is the, the idea of this paper basically is that ultimately when, when academics test strategies, when they test factors, they usually use the first universe I was talking about, which is they usually use a universe which includes these micro cap stocks. And so what you have to do is, as someone who's following these strategies is think about, well, what happens if those micro cap stocks are not in the sample? If, if I assume, you know, if I'm not a very small investor and I'm not investing in micro cap stocks, what happens to the results if those stocks either aren't there or their weighting is, looks more like my second option, which is their weighting looks more like the market cap weighting rather than their half the sample. And that's basically what this paper did is this paper took 452 different anomalies. It's amazing to think there even are 452 different anomalies, but they went and looked at every, you know, as much academic research as they could find that identified anomalies. And then they tried to look at, you know, do these anomalies hold up when I limit the impact of micro cap stocks. And, there, and there's two ways you can limit the impact of micro cap stocks. One is you can just eliminate them from the sample altogether. And the other is you can sort of value weight is which they was what they call it in academics where I'm giving, you know, it's like a market cap weighting type thing. So they reran all of these anomalies using those two things and said, all right, are the, do the results still hold up? Are they still statistically significant when I do that? And, and what they found is that the vast majority of them do not. Um, and so I think it was something like 35% held up and 65% did not. And, um, and, and that was basically with micro caps still in the sample. And then when you eliminated micro caps altogether, you know, as opposed to evaluating them, it went down to 30% held up. And so what they found is that many of the things we're seeing in academic research, many of these anomalies that are identified without the effect of micro caps, they don't work. They don't hold up. Yeah. And just to kind of come up a level, you know, I think this is really important because at one point before this paper was written to the point that you just said there was 450 or maybe 500 you know sort of anomalies that had been identified in the academic research that supposedly showed you know outperformance and um it, it's it was also a couple of years ago and this maybe even a decade ago the the, the term factor zoo kind of was getting tossed around a lot because there was so many factors that were being written about and tested and that were supposedly showing this, you know, um, excess return in the market that it just, it was too much. And so I think researchers like the ones that were behind this paper, also AQR um, and other firms, you know, sort of started to look at this and say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. There can't be this many um, there can't be this many anomalies, this many factors that show, um, you know, excess performance like they're showing. And so, you know, they, these researchers really try to tackle that and really try to ask, OK, what were the and this is where I want you to comment, Jack, because they, they did find some. Um, like you said, it wasn't nearly as many when you remove this this micro cap um, or you put in the micro cap thresh thresholds. But, you know, they did find. Um, some factors, especially groups of factors, if you will, um, that outperform. So maybe, maybe you can, you can comment on that. Yeah. You know, first I just want to take a quick step back and just talk about what they actually tested just so we know what we're talking about. Um, and I'll just read this from the paper. Um, our replication, replication target consists of 452 anomalies, including 57, 69, 38, 79, 103, and 106 from momentum value versus growth, investment, profitability, intangibles, and trading friction. So those were the main categories they tested momentum, value versus growth, investment, profitability, intangibles, and trading friction. Um, and, and then what they did is they looked at the period from 1967 to 2016. 
Um, and they looked at annual, quarterly, and monthly sorting. So they tried to look at it in a lot of different ways. Um, and so then to get to your question, though, what held up and what didn't, you know, the first way we're going to look at this is, is in terms of categories. So each one of those categories I listed will look at how well did each, you know, did the anomalies hold up. And, and the worst was trading frictions. 93% of trading frictions did not hold up in their testing. Um, the second worst was intangibles, uh, 75%. Then um, profitability was 58% didn't hold up. Value was 54% didn't hold up. Momentum, 35% di didn't hold up. And then 29% of investment didn't hold up. So they found, you know, it was less than 50% in a lot of these cases of the anomalies they, they searched for didn't hold up in the real world. Now, the one caveat you want to say with this, though, is this does, you know, you, it would be easy to take this and say, all right, value investing doesn't work or momentum doesn't work or, or whatever it is, because, you know, especially with these ones that didn't hold up as well, like there's no, why would you even do it if only, you know, if less than half of these value anomalies held up, why would you be a value investor? But it's important to understand that behind that, they're looking at every potential value anomaly they can come up with. Behind that, there are value anomalies that did hold up well. Um, and so it's important to just not take this as a complete indictment of the entire world of factor investing. There are, there were anomalies within, other than trading frictions where most of them failed, there were significant anomalies that held up in all these. It's just that as a whole, looking at all 452, most of them did not. Right. And when we say anomalies here, we're really talking about specific investment metrics or factors or criteria. Something like the price to earnings ratio would be in this paper, they would define that as a specific anomaly. We may, we may you know, use, use the words investment criteria or factor, but those sort of terms are, um, uh, that's, anyways, just sort of defining that, making sure that that's clear when we say anomalies that we're talking about specific investment criteria. So, I mean, in terms of, let's kind of work through those then. Um, you know, what, what were some of the, I guess, let's start with maybe momentum and some of the growth related stuff. Um, what specific metrics seem to work uh, based on what was in the paper? Yeah, so the, the good news in this paper is a lot of the widely used metrics, you know, with the most academic research behind them did hold up. So in momentum, 12 minus 1 momentum held up. So that's good. That's probably the most widely used metric in practice. Um, and then what was interesting is a lot of the stuff around earnings estimates. So change in earnings forecast, earnings surprise, things like that in the momentum category held up. And, and as we mentioned before, momentum was one of the categories where more held up than some of the other categories. Um, and then within value is the same type of thing. Um, you know, if you look at the big name value factors, most of them held up. Price to book, which might surprise some people because it's, you know, most people don't like price to book right now. Price to earnings, price to cash flow, EV to EBITDA. Um, probably the, the main one in value that did not hold up was price to sales, which is interesting. Um, and then dividend yield, but dividend yield, you know, a lot of us that use factors, you know, are not big fans of dividend yield. So it wouldn't be shocking to me that dividend yield didn't hold up. But that gets back to the point I was talking about before. Even though maybe on, as a whole, there were problems with factors here, a lot of these, the names I just said are a lot of the factors that are most widely used. So this is not necessarily an indictment of using factors in general. And by the way, we, what we're doing with our models and our strategies, just before we get to maybe some of the key lessons here is, you know, we're combining um, a number of different criteria together. So many of the strategies we use, you know, it might incorporate a valuation metric, but then maybe there's a quality measure or an investment measure, whatever might come in. So the way we construct models is you were sort of building these things and multiple investment criteria um, are being, you know, combined together to select a group of stocks where these guys are just, you know, testing one criteria across, you know, a universe of um, security. So just pointing out there are a lot of different ways that you can kind of utilize these different factors, if you will, in investment strategies. Um, what do you think are, I guess, and this is something that, you know, they don't re really talk about in the paper. What we try to do here is, you know, look at something like this and kind of draw some key lessons or conclusions that investors might be able to sort of think about in the real world um, as a result of this these tests and this research. So, I mean, what would be in your mind, maybe a few, and I'll, I'll try to build off this if I can. Well, I mean, the first would be just don't take an academic paper and just start investing with it. Um, you know, obviously you want to look behind the scenes and see what went on in the testing and see if it applies to me and what I'm doing as an investor before I just start using it. Um, you know, we, we always want to trust or after trust, after we verify what, what we're seeing there and whether it applies to me. Um, and the other one that I talked about before is, you know, metrics matter a lot. Um, so, 
you can't just say, you know, I want to be a value investor and I can use any type of metric I want to try to figure out the best way to find value stocks. There are ones that are better than others. Um, and that, that's a big conclusion from this paper is when you look at the value metrics, a lot of them didn't hold up, but some core ones did. And so it's, it's important to understand that the way you're representing value means something. Um, it's not just you can just pick anything to represent value. Um, and then the last one was just to look at your specific situation and match it to if you're going to use academic research and match it to what you use. So if, let me give you three examples. So if I'm a individual investor with a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, who's buying micro cap stocks as part of my strategy, well, then I can, you know, I may not, you know, use this paper too much to, to reduce the value of those anomalies because I am investing in the micro cap stocks. So I don't, I'm not that worried about the fact that they didn't hold up. If you're us and you take half of your universe, you know, and eliminate it. So you only have the stocks above a certain threshold. We need to pay a lot of attention to this because, you know, if, if these effects only work in micro caps, then for us, we can't follow those anomalies. And then if you're on the furthest extreme, if you're Warren Buffett, you probably can't use even the anomalies this paper found were good. You probably can't use those either because you're so big. And so it's important just to look at how you're investing and to make sure that, you know, when you use academic research, it matches up with that. And, and it also applies to the long short thing I said before is, you know, if you're not someone who shorts, make sure you're only looking at the long side of this academic research, make sure you're not looking at the short side. So th those were just a few things I think you can conclude from this. Okay, yeah, those are good points. The, the few things that I want to mention is, you know, it's important to realize that when you see the performance in these academic papers, um, you have to understand that no strategy works all the time. And, you know, we run a lot of, we run a lot of strategies here. And I think you recently did, um, a, a test, Jack, where you looked across all of the models that we run, the 45 different strategies, and you were able to, looking backwards with hindsight, say, what is the optimal set of three strategies when combined together? And even with perfect hindsight, you know, a strategy, the best three, the best, com the, the top combination, you know, only performed, outperformed the market 70% of the time on all one year rolling periods. So, 30% of the time it underperforms. So the important thing to realize, whether you're looking at um, you know, an academic test or maybe a back test or whatever it might be, is that you know, these strategies, they will always go through periods of underperformance. And in a lot of cases, as this paper pointed out, you know, a lot of these factors actually don't even work when you adjust um, for micro cap stock. So it, you know, that, that's the only thing I want to say. And the other, maybe the, the, the one, one other thing is, you know, it's important to look under the hood at what types of companies a strategy is selecting and also asking yourself sort of at a foundational level, what, why, why might this strategy actually work? What is it trying to uncover? What types of stocks is it trying to pick? And I think sort of thinking about that is important when you read some of these academic papers are super dense and they're complex and they're filled with T stats and statistics and stuff, but really trying to get at like the heart of what this specific model or test is trying to uncover um, is important when you're looking at these academic papers and then trying to sort of relate them to how, you know, you might invest. Yeah, just a couple things I would say to close up. Um, one is, you know, it's important to understand that what they're not saying here, and they're not saying that these, all these factors, the papers that wrote them were wrong. You know, there's a difference between something being wrong and then you looking at the under the hood and looking at the details and say, all right, when I carve out this group, it doesn't work as well. Um, so the, the academic research was probably pretty solid on most of these anomalies they're looking at. They're just saying when micro caps or the impact of micro caps is reduced, the excess return is either gone or, you know, it's, it's reduced. Um, and the second thing, and I think the main lesson from this, I'll, I'll read a quote. We did an interview with Lu Zhang, who's one of the co-authors of this paper um, for our five questions written series. And I think the way he concluded it is a good way to conclude this. And he said, the main lesson for investors is to always do replication before taking any results published or unpublished seriously. Trust, but verify. Nowadays, I just verify if I'm interested in any results that I come across. I've learned through pain to trust only results to survive independent internal replication within my teams. The referee process in top, top academic journals leaves much to be desired. The self-correcting mechanism of science only works in the long run and only for the most important results. So I think that's a good way to, to sum this up is you just want to make sure you verify what you're looking at. And don't just say, you know, this, this high ranking, you know, professor at this institution wrote this paper, so I should trust it. You know, you should always verify it yourself. All right. Good point. So guys, hopefully this was um, somewhat valuable. We'll try to do this once a month, taking an academic paper, kind of peeling back the onion and trying to talk through it and talk about some of the lessons we think investors can learn from it. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Thank you.
Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.